Welcome to the 16th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Daniel Foray. Eh? And we're going to do something else. Command line love. Command line love. Sorry. Uh, we also got. A, um, we'll also read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura, and joining me are Mark. Hello. And Tony. Hello. Alan's still on a boat somewhere. Yes, God, that's a long boat trip. It is. I wonder if he's sunk. <laughs> <laughs> Such a Why lovely would you thought. say that? I've now got a vision of him stood at the front of the boat. Near far. <laughs> I'm the king As the of the narrow boat yeah. breaks into you and sinks to the bottom of the canal. <laughs> of the three foot deep canal. <laughs> Alan's there with Davy's arms around him. Holding king him of the world. The prow. Please, we don't need Throwing that Throwing jewellery into the canal. <laughs> because that's what happened in the movie. Okay. So, Mark, what have you been doing? I built a new computer. Well, mm. I didn't quite build a new computer. That's I, quite old school. I upgraded my old computer. So I built a computer many years ago, and the um, the graphics card was quite old, so it didn't really play new games very well. But also, um, ATI have stopped supporting it, so it no longer has a driver which builds with the kernel version oh. that Ubuntu uses. So for the past... Six months I've been using a backported kernel, which somehow supports the driver for the old graphics card. So anyway, I threw that away and I bought a um, an AMD APU, which is like a system on a chip which has accelerated 3D graphics and CPU on the same chip. All oh, right, on the motherboard. Uh, yes. Oh, well, cool. so well, you yeah, you buy it as a separate chip and plug it into the socket where you would normally just have the CPU. Oh wow! So that is the integrated graphics. Oh, well, that's oh, okay. Sounds cool. Yes, I didn't know you could do that. No, you can now because right. because AMD now own ATI. Yeah, so they've got the graphics um, manufacturing capacity as well as the yeah the CPU manufacturing capacity. So you can buy a, a sort of all in one thing, which is you know quite it's cheaper than than buying all the bits, and it was you know not that much more expensive than just upgrading the um, the discrete graphics card which I had. Um, okay. And yeah, it works really well. It's it's what the um, I think the the Xbox is going to be use new Xbox is going to be using one, and the um, new PlayStation I think is going to be using one as well because it means that you get uh, I suppose it's probably lower power usage as well. Has it got flashing lights on it? No flashing lights, I'm afraid. But it was it was an interesting experience going from because um, I, I also upgraded Ubuntu in the process, so I had to disable the 3D graphics drivers swap out the motherboard and the graphics card and then plug the um plug the hard drive into the new one boot up and then enable uh, then update and enable the graphics drivers right and it all worked oh wow yeah that is still one of the nice things about linux the fact that you can move your installs between machines and it doesn't it doesn't say oh my god the hardware has changed how dare you yeah you're obviously a pirate yes no absolutely i think i've had the same install since about 2006 and Mm. it's just been moved from computer to computer if not longer when my laptop broke down and i needed to get the motherboard replaced and i said have you got a spare laptop i can use and the guy's like well what version of windows have you got and I was like, well, it's not Windows, it's Linux. Oh, that's fine then. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it down, swapped hard drives. It just worked. It was brilliant. He was dead impressed. Tony. Yes, Laura, what have you been doing? <laughs> okay, I've got a new job. Oh, Ooh. okay. What job? I'm going to be a community manager type. Oh, so you're not going to Joining the work? ranks of uh, the internet's John O'Bacon. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and the internet's Andy Piper. And the internet's on, yes. And, and so you're not going to be working for a living. You're going to be um, getting tweeting. Other, tweeting and writing <laughs> blog posts. Yes. Okay. Well, you yes. can, are you going to start barbecuing lots of food as well, like John A does? I didn't know that was a prerequisite. I think it is. Which community are you managing? If oh, you yeah. have a look at my Twitter feed, you'll be probably be able to guess. Okay. I don't have time to do that now. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's a, a, ho- a lesson for all the listeners at home as well, presumably. Yes. Excellent. Cool. Right. Well, um, I've been experimenting with... with <laughs> since we asked. Since, since you, we asked. Since you didn't ask. Well, I, just, I started just, to ask and you wouldn't let me. It was just an awkward pause. I've been experimenting with internet meat. Internet meat? <laughs> yep. You're Is that where you beat me. people on the internet? <laughs> no, it, oh, it's, it's meat that comes from the internet. I don't think that's real. You go to a web- Is this like some vat-grown genetic experiment? 
maybe i basically you go to a website and then a, a van pulls up at your house and a man gives you some meat <laughs> massive box of meat <laughs> big meat i see yeah and is it tasty it is very tasty yeah, <laughs> yeah to yeah. be fair it's better than what you get from the supermarket <laughs> Apologies to any vegetarians listening, having to hear about Tony's meat adventures. Well, we also get vegetables through the post sometimes, so... <laughs> yeah. You didn't order them, they would just push through the letterbox. <laughs> yeah. Runner beans, they finish, finish, if you ever... <laughs> well, I think we should probably get on with the show. That's why, it, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so let's listen to the interview with, with Daniel while we go and have some cake. I mean, all vegetables. Part, and, part uh, way through, you might hear somebody trying to push some vegetables <laughs> through the letterbox. Yeah, um, there were occasional little dropouts on the connection with Daniel, but we tried to clean them up as best we can in the time we have available to us. So hopefully you will enjoy the interview. <laughs> Whenever we ask our listeners for ideas of people to speak to, we always get a lot of feedback about wanting to hear from people from Ubuntu derivatives. And the one that was at the top of the list this time around was Elementary OS. So we are very pleased to have on the line Daniel from Elementary. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. So please tell us what is Elementary OS? Elementary OS is, like you said, a derivative of Ubuntu uh, focused on uh, bringing great design through our new gtk desktop okay so if you haven't heard of elementary um what would people experience when they booted up for the first time uh, i think the the biggest difference that people will see uh, between elementary and, and most other distros is uh, that we actually have a suite of apps and a desktop environment all designed based around the same os concept so it's very much as if uh, gnome or kde got together and, and built a distro based around their specific experience. So the uh, the idea of KDE and GNOME collaborating and building a distro together could produce some rather uh, horrific images in people's <laughs> minds, but I guess you're looking for oh, the best so, the best sorry, of that possible collaboration. <laughs> sorry, I meant, uh, or like, uh, uh, like a, a vertical integration is what I meant to say. So you meant like a, a KDE desktop if... with lots of all the KDE style apps in a, in a distro rather right. than bits of KDM. No, right. Okay. <laughs> so does does that mean that you're you're not using either KDE or GNOME? Uh, no, we actually have our, our own um, new GTK based desktop called Pantheon that we've been developing for the past couple of years. Uh huh. And is that an entire environment? What 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 is he within Pantheon? Uh, yeah, it's it's everything. Um, a window manager um, called Gala. You know, it's uh, our file browser, our uh, application launcher, slingshot, um, a panel system. Uh, we use uh, indicators that are compatible with uh, the Ubuntu Ayatana spec. Uh, we have a, a system settings app, um, all the basics you'd expect from from your standard uh, DE. So, what was the um, objective behind uh, Elementary OS? Originally, it started out from from you know most uh, FOSS projects as kind of scratching our own niche, um, and it, it was a thing of we wanted to build these great apps and and this great experience. And we we started putting that together, and we went, oh, oh well, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if we had a DE for these all to live in. And then we, it kind of kept snowballing to where we're like, wow, it'd be great to have a distro for this DE to live in, so we could we could package it up and ship it all together to a user the way that we intended them to experience it. So who is it behind Elementary OS? Is it a group of contributors or is there a company? It's just a community of contributors. Uh, we don't have any uh, employees whatsoever. It, it's it's probably 20 to 30 um, part-time uh, high school and college students um, just trying to make something new and fun. Why base it on Ubuntu? Uh, Ubuntu uh, worked out for us in a lot of ways as far as um, not only just because there's such great support from uh, third parties as far as uh, hardware vendors and things like Steam popping up and things like that, but but also uh, because of the services associated with Ubuntu, like Launchpad. Uh, without everything provided by Launchpad, uh, I'm not sure that elementary would have been possible. So were you Ubuntu users before you decided to start developing elementary? I'm not sure I could speak for everyone, but uh, personally I was. I, I used uh, Ubuntu to since uh, Hardy Heron. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a fair while ago. And you uh, you mentioned that, that um, most of your contributors are from high school and college. Is there a particular reason that you think it's 
um, sort of quite a young base of committers, sort of, um, yeah, as, a, as an average age? Or is it just that, um, you know, they, people knew each other from college or high school and got together that way? It's uh, not necessarily that people knew each other because we're, we're spread out in all, all different countries. Um, I'm not sure if it's just the, the attitude that we have in general or um, the kind of spin that we put on things, maybe a, a design focus that we have. So are you um, but, kind of? But like you said, we definitely are attracting a lot of younger users. Mm. So are you compu- uh, again? I'm not necessarily expect you to speak for everybody, but in general, are you sort of computer science students, or is there a wider range? Uh, I myself am not a I'm not a computer science student. I know we have several contributors that are. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one of the things that I noticed when I fired up Elementary for the first time was that it looks quite a lot like Mac OS ten. Mac OS X. Um, that's, is that a deliberate move? Uh, we've had that comment a lot in the past, and not necessarily. Um, you know, we we try to take uh, inspiration from everywhere. Um, you can see, like, the way our app launcher uh, behaves is uh, reminiscent of the new app launcher in Chrome OS. Um, mm-hmm. Our title, or, I'm sorry, our, our panel uh, looks a lot like the one from GNOME Shell. Um, the way we have you know the dock is is similar to OS 10, but um, Unity also has a dock. Uh, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. Windows 7 had a dock style. So, so I think in some ways, uh, some of the design things are are just uh, hiding in plain sight, where you know it makes sense to do things that way. Do you have a lot of designers among your contributors? As far as uh, um, main recurring designers uh we have just two myself and cassidy james uh we had uh, another guy who was contributing uh, a lot for a while but you know he got busy with school and things um we've had people um just drop mock-ups here and there or or make small contributions um when i was looking through the website at what's included in uh, elementary os i noticed that you've you know you you make quite clear that there's a, lo- you know, a load of pre-included apps which have been selected by specific criteria but a lot of them I hadn't really heard of before. I mean, there's a couple in there like Midori, the web browser, uh, Geary, the email client, which I'd seen around. But the others seem to have sort of, you know, been beneath my radar. So where did where did all these come from? What made you choose to select them? Almost all of the apps that uh, we ship default are things we've really, um, created ourselves. Right. Okay. And uh, this 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 arised from you know a need of. Uh, having things be consistent and, and fit in with the overall vision. Um, mm-hmm. When we had an app like uh, Midori that uh, was menuless and we thought, oh, this is really great, you know, why aren't other apps doing this? And and so we went with that uh, direction with Nautilus um, originally back uh, before we created our own file browser. And, and we started looking at other apps and, and the consistency issues that they had. And, and we just came to the conclusion that we'd need to start building our own apps to really give this great consistent experience. Is the uh, workload of maintaining and developing those apps uh, a, a lot? Is there other concerns about how you can support that? Uh, yeah, if you uh, are a fan of Olo.net, um, yeah. their their kind of estimation of the cost of our code base is at about $7 million right now. <laughs> so it's a lot of code. Um, yeah. You know, there there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of code. So sometimes it's stressful, you know, when you have um, one or two people maintaining three or four pro- projects, uh, you know, but the more attention that we get, the more people help out. And now we've got to the point where we have two or three developers to one project. So when did you start? I'd say the absolute origins of elementary probably started in, 2007 or 2008 Mm -hmm. um, but it really kicked into gear uh, when we started developing luna in 2010 okay so is that when you made your first release calling it elementary uh yeah yeah we uh, we actually uh made our first release jupiter um which was a lot closer to uh, ubuntu we used uh, gnome 2 Mm -hmm. and we only had a couple of the the custom maps we had started to develop and after that release, uh, when we started getting a little more attention, a little more developer power <laughs> behind it, that's when we really started to evolve as a community and build a, a real, true new operating system. So how, how many people are involved, you know, now who regularly contribute? We probably have 20 to 30 regular contributors. 
Uh, over the lifetime of the project, I think we've probably seen 200 or so. Wow. You know, people come and go. Mm-hmm. Well, what does it mean? Um, at the moment, it says on the website that um, you can get a beta version of Elementary OS. What does it mean to you as a project to, you know, what, when is it stable? What says this is version 1.0 or whatever you decide to call it? Right. Uh, that's, that's always the big question is people are asking, you know, when's it ready? Because we don't mm-hmm. uh, want to provide a, a static release date. And the real answer to that, that is kind of when our users let us know that it's ready, um, we pay attention to our, our bug reports really closely. Um, they're very important to us, and we really value our users' feedback. And as long as we're still getting reports from users that they're having show-stopping issues, um, then I think it's not quite ready yet. As soon as we can resolve our users' issues and make sure that we're providing something um, that isn't just breaking terribly on people's machines, I think at that point, then we can call it stable. Do you find that as you're in the middle of development, um, and then a new version of Ubuntu comes out, does that tend to knock you back, or is it fairly smooth moving from one version of Ubuntu to the next? We haven't had that problem yet because we're um, based on 12 of 4 LTS right now. Right. So we'll see uh, We'll see how what happens when the next LTS comes out. So um, is it a decision that you're only going to go from LTS release to LTS release? At the moment, that's sort of the unspoken plan. Uh, we don't currently offer an upgrade path uh, from 12.04 to 12.10 which uh, is based off of 12.04. Um, but in the future, uh, we're not quite sure exactly what we want, want to target with the possibility of Ubuntu going to a rolling release. Mm-hmm. So what's next? Uh, well, uh, we still have to make sure that we get uh, Luna Stable out the door, and uh, we're hoping to do that uh, relatively soon. We're getting a lot less show-stopping reports from our users. Mm-hmm. And after Luna, um, there's going to be a, a big period where we're up Upgrading everything to the newest libraries, uh, the newest GTK, you know, Pulse Audio, things like that. Upgrading our base, and uh, also, you know, we want to get excited about things like touch and uh, social integration and online accounts. Are you looking for more developers or more contributors in other ways? Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for for people to uh, come help out on the project. Is there like specific uh, areas where you're looking for people at the moment? Developers are always in high demand. If you know us. Uh, See your Vala, you're especially valuable. Right. But uh, even if you don't have uh, programming experience, we can always use people to help track, track down bug reports or with mm-hmm. translations or to uh, triage existing reports or help support other users. So if anyone wants to uh, get involved or just to try out Elementary OS, where do they find out more? You can go to our, our website, www.elementaryos.org, and there's actually a link called Get Involved. Oh, brilliant. Does Excellent. it go to slash get involved? Uh, you know, it should, but I, <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. I can't guarantee it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming on to talk to us, Daniel. Um, I, I can tell from our feedback from our, our listeners that uh, Elementary's got a lot of people quite excited. And I must admit, from the uh, the bit of experimentation I've done with it as well, it certainly looks uh, very slick already. And uh, with a bit more polish before the release is final, it looks like it can uh, really uh, be a useful alternative to Ubuntu on the desktop. So congratulations to you and the rest of the uh, elementary team. Thank you very much. Cool. And thank you very much indeed for coming on and talking to us. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers then. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. And now it's time for some command line love. Wow. <laughs> that was deep, quite literally. <laughs> right. Dear me. What's the command I love this time, Mark? It's Ubuntu support status. And what does Ubuntu support status do? Well, Tony. No, that was no. Um, it tells you the support status of your package. Right. Is, okay. I believe. Yes. You ran it, so you tell me. Yep. So it shows you um, how many packages you have and when they are supported until. Oh, that's cool. So, for example, I ran it on my netbook and it said I have 1,997 packages, 80% of the ones that are installed, and they are supported until January 2014, which is when the support for 12.10 finishes. Right. Which is what I'm running. So that makes sense. 
I think. Um, and I have 12 packages that are supported until March 2014. Mm-hmm. I don't know why only 12 <laughs> or where they've come from. Um, but so they're presumably they're still from 1204. Is that one? Well, March so 2014 is longer than January 2014, so I'm a bit confused. Oh, right, yes. Um, but yes, you can actually run some, run it with some extra switches that will tell you the details. Right. I, I'm guessing because the support the support um, commitment for the releases has changed in the past, so perhaps you've got some packages from... Yes. Which you inst- can, uh, have you upgraded your laptop? Or Lots. have you reinstalled? Yeah, in that case, you might have some packages that are left over from a previous install, which were supported for longer. Possibly. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, so do you have to download this or is it already there? Well, it was already there on my machine. So right. uh, it's quite useful to be able to see what's going on with your, with your machine. Um, Especially, it, I imagine, if you've got a server, which is mission critical. Yeah. And you want to be able to check when you need to start doing upgrades. Yes. And conveniently, it also tells you packages you've got that are not supported at all anymore anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and ones that um, can no longer be downloaded, so presumably aren't being updated. Right. Yes. So another another kind of useful way to be able to look at what's on your system. Yeah. Check it out, I say. Ubuntu support status. Do that. Cool. And now it's time for your feedback. Hooray! And Comet Cycle tweeted us to say... A morning full of Laura's. Listened to two on the UUPC podcast, and then another as coach on this couch. Oh, on NHS couch to 5k run. So somebody else called Laura's coaching him, presumably, on a couch or something. A trio of Laura's. Yes. We also heard from Aditya Patidia on Twitter. Addy the Star on Twitter. Um... UPC, hey, this is sorry. At UPC, hey, this is um, Aditya from India, and I just want to say I love this podcast and its presenters. Probably a little probably bit less, less now. now. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> sorry about sorry. that. Sorry. <laughs> mm, and this came in from Lopter. I like a podcast that makes me laugh loudly while I'm driving. <laughs> that sounds safe. <laughs> yeah. I think under the new rules that they just announced here in the UK, you can probably be fined £100 for listening to the Ubuntu podcast while driving. It's driving under the influence of the Ubuntu UK podcast. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Not while you're driving, please. Expert on the capacitive properties of teapots, Phelan Whiteley, emailed in. Really been enjoying the show. Not sure about the 30-minute shows. I like both the weekly dose but also feel a bit sad when they're over so quick but i guess i like them i remember at the start of the season you were playing on interviewing more derivatives and i asked about kubuntu is it still on the cards is it some anti-kde conspiracy due to jonathan riddell's criticism of canonical shocked inhaling i also know you might not want to read this out understandable so don't worry it's all right alan's not here this week so we can talk about this we're free we're free from the oversight of the canonical gestapo (laughs) investigating us didn't we actually interview john riddell this season uh i think we interviewed him towards the end of last season and i've we certainly interviewed him at least twice in previous seasons and things as well just interviewed an ubuntu derivative yeah we've uh interviewed one um just then but we also interviewed one earlier this season as well so mm. we are keen of course to keep talking to people and people like jonathan can come on and tell us what's new um so yeah we just don't like to repeat ourselves too often we've had a voicemail from down under what an extraordinary voice message the person extension one zero 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 is unavailable if i've run the uk podcast then hello from melbourne australia you're not alone there are people listening to you albeit a hell of a long way away. Lovely to have some intelligent ladies on the line there listening to them talking about all things you want to. Anyway, so yes, you are loved. 24 hour flights away, but you are. And luckily the calls these days cost about nothing. So keep up the good work. One day you might have even an operating system that can be sold alongside Windows. But... Yeah, there we go. Well, oh, thank so you. So we are loved in Australia. That's good. Yeah, and hopefully somewhere else a bit closer. <laughs> but yes, it's always nice to hear that you love us. Why not, you know, do Send that. us a voicemail. Send us a voicemail telling us that you love us. Um, yeah. <laughs> In fact, if you listen now, you'll find out how you can do that. 
The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And that's it for this episode. Join us on Wednesday the 19th of June at 19.30 UTC for our next live episode. That's 20.30 BST for those in the UK. How far into the summer do we have to be before we stop telling people what the time in the UK is as opposed to UTC? I don't know. About I, October. I'm very cautious after <laughs> angry emails we've had regarding time zones in the past. Yeah, those are like three years ago. That was season and four. And they still hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the clock's changed every six months and everybody's still confused. Uh, yeah, but I, I, it confuses me having to read that out and I think every time whether we need to change it or not. Maybe we should switch to internet time. What's the internet time? I think um, Swatch defined it. It's like a decimal time a day is one and it's divided into fractions of a, a day. We could just do it in binary time. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this all hurts. In, I've got, internet time is one thing. Binary time is another thing. Well, bi- binary time is just a representation of, of normal time. Uh, yeah, no, of, 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 it's the one that Andy SC's got on his flip flapper thing. Tablet? No. <laughs> uh, second Life. It's just a binary representation of Unix time, I think. I right. See. Okay. I see, I've, seen, I've seen binary clocks which are like binary coded decimal of, so you 12 is like a binary coded decimal of one and two. Yeah. Which I used to have, I used to have one of those sitting on my desktop when I was studying computing at college to help me do binary quickly. I think one thing is probably guaranteed though, no matter what time we say in the show there'll always be somebody who turns up just after we've finished in the irc <laughs> channel saying oh when does the show start yes. yeah that uh, always happens there we go. uh yeah you just missed the whole thing you can download it tomorrow though so that's okay yes or yeah. half of it tomorrow yeah <laughs> download half of yes yeah, something like that. um so yeah hopefully alan will be back with us next time i guess Ooh, unless yes. he finds a new excuse <laughs> yeah yeah so hopefully for, he he doesn't get you know taken by pirates or anything <gasps> yeah are there a lot of those in near birmingham <laughs> you'd be surprised <laughs> yeah yeah some, somebody sold off his boat for scrap or something um i think his car broke down as well so he oh, tried to, to get that fixed um but yes anyway thank you very much for listening and we will speak to you next time bye, bye.